What's a fact that's technically true, but nobody understands correctly? Story 1. Occam's razor doesn't say that the simplest explanation is usually the right one. It says that we shouldn't add unnecessary complexity to an explanation when a simpler one is sufficient. Meaning, you still need an explanation capable of fully explaining something, even if the explanation is complex. Story 2. A lot of people know that the temperature settings on many thermostats, particularly in office buildings, have no effect. This is true. Many people, though, think this means the thermostat isn't connected to anything. This is rarely true. You see, the thermostat does two things. First, the thermostat serves a necessary control function. It measures the actual temperature of the room and turns on the heating cooling system to match some target temperature when the actual temp is too far from the target temp. Second, it lets the user set the target temperature. It's the second thing that is sometimes fake. All rooms that are served by a climate control system have connected thermostats. The thermostat is absolutely a required component of a heating system. The difference is significant because you can still control the temperature in a room even if the thermostat doesn't accept your input. All you have to do is manipulate the actual temperature that the thermostat measures. If you put an ice pack on the thermostat, it measures a lower than accurate temperature and causes extra heating. Story 3. There are 60 different Inuit words for snow. Whilst this is technically correct, it isn't just snow translated into 60 different words. As with German, the language uses compound words. For example, where we would say soft snow or hard snow, Inuit speakers would say soft snow or hard snow. Once these compound words are translated, that's where the figure 60 comes from. So rather than snow being translated into 60 different words, each word is used for a type of snow. Story 4. Murphy's Law stating that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. People interpret it to mean that everything will go wrong all the time, but that would be absurd. The real meaning is that if you repeat the same process over a long enough time span, anything that can go wrong with that process eventually will. It's relevant to engineering and software development. As a reminder, never to assume anything that can go wrong won't, because eventually it will. Story 5. Inbreeding doesn't cause problems. It just doesn't avoid problems. If my genes have a chink in their armor, a woman that isn't related to me will bring her own genetic flaws, but we both have a chance to patch the holes in one another's genes, provided we don't share any. Our offspring might get her genes where mine were flawed, and might get my genes in areas hers were flawed in. My sister, on the other hand, has many of the same problems with her genes as I do, making it a good, sure bet our offspring would have them. She still might not be a carrier for some, and I might not be for others. We're siblings, after all, not clones. But it increases the chance of those gaps lining up, and where we match isn't patched. If that continues for generations, that means there are a lot of problems that aren't patched over. But that said, non-inbreeding doesn't ensure the flaws aren't carried on either. And inbreeding doesn't make flaws. A brother and sister with a solid genetic makeup will have a kid with a solid genetic makeup. Story 6. The phrase, a little knowledge, is a dangerous thing. Most people I've met think it means either knowing very little is bad, or that letting people know too much is bad, depending on their particular form of cynicism. What Alexander Pope actually meant was that it was dangerous when people didn't know something fully, causing confusion, mistakes, or disaster. Drink deep or taste not the Pierian spring is the completion of the quote, meaning either take the time to really understand something or don't bother with it at all, but never dabble. Story 7. If you ignore the early work of Wilhelm Wundt, then yeah, Sigmund Freud is the father of modern psychology and the one who really helped science get off the ground. That does not mean his theories and methods are the be-all end all of science. You wouldn't believe the sheer number of people I meet who think psychology begins and ends with sitting on a couch and talking about how maybe you secretly want to burn your mother. Story 8. Average life expectancy in past eras. An average life expectancy of 30 doesn't mean everyone was dropping dead around that age and that few people lived past it. It's an average. Infant mortality rates were incredibly high in a lot of eras, which brings the average age at time of death significantly lower. It's probably closer to 50 plus in a lot of cases. Yeah, life expectancy in, say, the Middle Ages was pretty much, did you survive past two, three years old? You have good odds at reaching 50, assuming you're not drafted into a war. Story 9. Schrodinger's cat is something in this vein. This little thought experiment leaked through the internet and into pop culture and has been wreaking havoc ever since. 
Most people have no idea what the concepts stated in it are, or what they mean, or why Schrodinger proposed the experiment. That doesn't stop them from wearing a Schrodinger's cat is dead or not dead shirt, though. First off, people often truncate a very important detail. Typically, you hear that if a cat is in a box, it's alive and dead at the same time. The original experiment involved a vial of vial poison, though, which was tied to a device measuring whether a small amount of radioactive material has decayed or not. Now, according to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, the cat is in a superposition of both alive and dead until it is observed, which basically means that some measure of aliveness has been made. Observation requires interaction. Here's the funny part. This wasn't proposed as an actual phenomenon or a means of explaining Copenhagen. It was used as a means of pointing out how positively absurd Copenhagen becomes when it interacts with macroscopic objects. The thought experiment amounts to a mocking objection, not an explanation. Yet time and time again, people bring it up to explain quantum mechanics. Another thing I hinted at above that people don't get. When people talk about the double slit experiment, they often think that the fact that the behavior of these particles changes when observed means that we're all intertwined with these particles, and they must have some sort of method of knowing that we're watching. This is because people misunderstand what meant by observe and take it literally to mean look upon with your eyes. Observe in this case necessitates direct interaction. A better word would be measure, but this misunderstanding is so pervasive that entire movements have been started justifying all kinds of woo and quackery because they think that we control photons with our minds. Crap. There's even a whole movie, The Bleep Do We Know, that takes the misunderstanding and spins all kinds of pseudoscience from it. Story 10. Yes, it is true that Van Halen does have a stipulation in their venue contracts that demands a bowl of M&Ms with no brown ones in it, and it is true that they will cancel a concert at the venue's expense if one brown M&M is found. However, this is not because they're a bunch of snobby divas out to exploit and torment their venue's engineering staff or assert some sort of humiliating dominance over them. This is an on-site test. The band sneaks into a contract to ensure that the venue read the instructions thoroughly and was willing to fulfill them. They are arriving with six truckloads of equipment, lighting, and pyrotechnics. They don't want to spend six hours setting up a stage only to realize that their power outlets aren't spaced close enough to plug in their amps. They don't want to construct an entire lighting rig before discovering the stage starts to warp under the weight, and they certainly don't want their fireworks to dangerously misfire due to a faulty circuit. Yet those details won't be realized until well after they have begun the construction process, after wasting so much time and effort, and they realize the venue totally failed to uphold all the requirements stipulated in their contract. However, the M&M's requirement is an immediate indicator that their instructor were followed and finding one brown M&M is enough justification to call the whole thing off. If the venue couldn't sort out a bowl of candy-coated chocolates, how can they trust them to sort out the electronics for their firework shows? How can they trust them to have a stage that won't collapse onto itself? How can they trust that they actually read the band's requirements and pay attention to the small detail? Story 11. The Three-Fifths Compromise Yes, it's said that slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person. This was not a means by which racists demeaned black people by deeming them worth less than a white person. In fact, the slaveholding South wanted to treat slaves as a full person because that way they would have higher representation in Congress, whereas the anti-slavery faction wanted to exclude slaves entirely, that is, count them as zero for purposes of the population count in order to limit the South's political power. Yes, the slave owners wanted to count slaves as people in terms of population, but they still wanted them to be considered non-people so that they could still justify owning them as property. They essentially wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Story 12 Theory of Relativity Specifically, time dilation. It's actually very simple to get your head around. Time slows down the faster you move, but here's the bit many people don't get. It only slows down relative to an observer. For you, Time passes at the exact same rate. So let's take two travelers. We'll call them Bert and Ernie. Imagine they are both in spaceships with no nearby points of reference. Bert sees Ernie dash off at near light speed. When Bert measures Ernie's clock, he observes it to be moving much slower than his. But Ernie observes his clock moving at the exact same speed as normal. Now it is just as valid for Ernie to say that he saw Bert zooming away at near light speed. And if he were to measure Bert's clock, he would conclude that Bert's clock is moving slowly, 
and his own is passing at a normal rate. In other words, there's no such thing as absolute motion or time. Both can only be measured relative to another frame of reference. Story 13, The Centrifugal Force. Most people who have taken high school physics will tell you that it doesn't exist and that the only force required to keep something moving in a circle is a centripetal force acting towards the center of rotation. However, this kind of raises the question, why does the term centrifugal force exist? Why do we have a word for something that is apparently a complete fabrication? The truth is that the high school physics model is only true as long as the motion is seen by an outside observer. This is the easiest way to describe it. However, if you study physics at university level, it is likely that you will come across something called non-inertial reference frames, where the motion is instead described as seen by the rotating object itself. In order for the physics to be correct in this case, you need to introduce two new forces the centrifugal force, and, interestingly enough, the Coriolis force. You know, the one that makes the currents in our oceans go round in circle. So, if you are sitting in a car that is going round a curve, and you feel yourself being pushed outwards, it is technically not incorrect to say that this is due to the centrifugal force, since you are, after all, a non-inertial observer. Story 14. Linguists study language. This is true in that linguists study the use and structure of languages. However, it is not true that linguists are necessarily bilingual or more. Noam Chomsky, to my knowledge, only knows English. Not to diminish the accomplishment of translators and interpreters, I'm currently studying Chinese and it's difficult, but these people are not linguists. They're translators or interpreters. People can know a lot about speaking a language without knowing a lot about language. See any ER slash ask credit thread about incorrect grammar or other annoying usage. Story 15, Nuclear Fusion. We can do it. Hell, I think we've been able to do it since the 1920s or so, 1932. But what we can't do is create a net gain of energy, at least not yet. Every time you see something about the NIF project achieving ignition, there is still a net loss of energy, meaning it took more energy to power the beams than was released when the fuel pellets fused. The joke about fusion as a renewable source of energy is that we're a few years away from using it, and have been since the 60s. Please keep in mind that this is a very simplified version of events. Story 16. Sweatshops can be a boon to poor countries. For example, in parts of Cambodia, people have to earn their living scraping plastic from gigantic trash dumps. A pound of plastic is worth a single dollar. For them, sweatshops would raise them out of despair and into poverty, something that they can only dream of. Sweatshops have actually caused some areas' standard of living to skyrocket, like some parts of China. Global efforts to ban sweatshops are certainly born of good intentions, but since people have a hard time accepting that sweatshops can be good, poor countries are just getting poorer. Story 17. Tryptophan causes drowsiness, and that's why turkey dinners knock you on your butt. Tons of stuff has as much or more tryptophan than turkey, like most other meats, cheese, nuts, egg whites, soy, etc., and that it's the size of the meal that affects your digestion and overall energy. Not the tryptophan or else pretty much any meal would affect you similarly. When consumed with lots of carbohydrates, like stuffing, potatoes, bread, etc., with a turkey dinner, tryptophan can cross the blood-brain barrier and is converted to serotonin and melatonin, your brain's happy and sleepy drugs. So part of it is the parasympathetic response from eating a lot. But turkey might make you sleepier than an equivalent amount of non-tryptophan-rich food when eaten alongside a lot of carbs. Story 18. Our budget and debt ceiling in the U.S. and many other countries too. When we gave up the gold standard, we adopted something called sovereign currency, which basically means the dollar has value, because we say it does. Think of dollar bills as an IOU from the government. So, while it is dangerous for us to continuously raise our debt ceiling, it is not for the popular supposed reason that we are running the piggy bank dry as most politicians seem to claim, because we can always print more currency. It's easier to use that explanation versus the more complicated true reason when talking to the masses. It is also almost always better to raise our debt ceiling than default on our obligations. I say almost because I hate saying things like always when you are talking about something as complicated as the economy. Source. I'm an economist. Story 19. Computers do not get slower as they get older. If you bought a 3 GHz computer in 2013, it will still be a 3 GHz computer 50 years later, or 100 years later. It has not slowed down at all, not by a single fraction of a nano degree. 
The reason why your tilde three-year-old PC is slower now than it was when you bought it is not because the machine is older, but because you're asking it to do more than it was doing when you first bought it. That upgrade from Vista to 8? You just added a crap ton of code that your computer needs to execute. That additional code takes up memory, drive space, and processor cycles. All those toolbars, screensavers, and God knows what else you've installed, and maybe uninstalled over the years also has taken its toll, forcing your PC to compensate for errors and issues and conflicts that didn't exist when you bought your machine. But it's still running at 3 GHz. Your computer may not be as responsive as it was 3 years ago, but it's still just as fast as it ever was. Story 20. I already posted an answer, but I thought of another. History is written by the victor. I mean, in reality, it's not even true, but there is an argument to be made for its validity. However, most people don't even use that. Most people use it to justify radical unsupported theories posited by fringe historians, or people who aren't even that. They believe that all popular history is wrong because it's only written by the winners, so their perspective is flawed. Put simply, that's wrong. From an initial starting point, it's wrong for simply implying that history is all about war, or competition, or whatever. All historians do is analyze topics with two sides, where one has obviously defeated the other, and eliminated their view from the historical record. That's just not true. While some historians occasionally work like this, there are even more who don't. Most are studying more abstract topics like trends, movements, an overall time period, or people. And with those, there's no one winner. There's more, but I have to go to lunch. I'll edit the rest when I get back to my computer. Continued. I guess I'll just keep writing while at lunch on my phone. Reddit deserves my full attention, not my girlfriend. Aside from all of that, there is a sort of kind of maybe a little, if you want to be like that argument for the phrase. That being that history is written by those who remember, and those who remember are usually those who won. I suppose that's sort of right in one sense, but it still implies that all that's been written about is war and conflict. Aside from that, though, it's still debatable. Just look at All Quiet on the Western Front, a book written by a German about the German experience during World War I. Again, history isn't written by the winner, it's just by anyone who bothers to care. That's more or less it. I'm only an undergraduate, so my opinion is a bit flawed. If anyone more versed in historiography wants to chime in, by all means do so. Story 21. The tomato being a fruit. It's true that botanically, tomatoes are fruit, but so are eggplants, beans, cucumbers, pumpkins, sweet peppers, and many other parts of plants that most people would call a vegetable. The word vegetable is a culinary term, not a botanical one, that is used to describe any savory fruit. Therefore, many vegetables are also fruits. The confusion arises because the word fruit has two different meanings. One is botanical and the other, culinary, used to distinguish sweet-tasting fruit from savory vegetables. So technically, a tomato is both a fruit, botanically, and a vegetable in the culinary sense. I'm not sure how this thing started with people constantly correcting others, who say the tomato is a vegetable. The tomato is a vegetable. It's also a fruit. The same is true of chili peppers, but no one ever corrects you and insists you call chili peppers fruit. Story 22. Peak oil. Any continually harvested limited resource will eventually decline. After peak, there's still lots of oil to be harvested, and it may never completely dry up. But when it takes more than one barrel's worth of energy to produce a barrel of, we will finally have to give up on liquid fossil fuels. The ancient inhabitants of Easter Island experienced peak trees, but kept at it till all the trees were gone. They knew it was happening, and they probably tried to do something, but it wasn't enough. But the real misunderstanding is in regards to the huge impact of the steady decline in oil production on the world's population. We won't have to run dry before life will be dramatically changed. The one key thing that allowed so many humans to exist is the wondrous cheap and abundant energy source that took millions and millions of years to form which we are using up in a few hundred years. This seems more a prediction than fact, but I'm pretty sure we're in too deep, and we are acting too slowly, too little too late, to stop the horrible impact that forced oil decline will have on billions on Earth. Story 23. The statistics about how much more a man makes for doing the same job as a woman. This stat is so misunderstood it's infuriating. Discrimination makes up very little of it. Larger factors include that men prefer money over working conditions, which women generally value more, and pregnancy. Women take an average of two maternity leaves in their career, all while male counterparts are moving up 
and getting promoted. Also, young women make more than young men and have higher employment. But try explaining this to female classmates, and you're worse than him. Story 24. The quote from the Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken, goes like this. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. This is more a misunderstood quote than a fact, but it's important to understand the misconception. If you read the poem closely, you'll see a message that's entirely different from the pick-your-own-path-in-life ethos that gets thrown around. Comparing the two paths, he notices that the passing there had warned them, really, about the same, and that they equally lay in leaves. He knows there is nothing significant about taking one road or the other, but he also knows that after his travels, perhaps at a dinner party, he will claim that taking the road less traveled changed his life. It didn't, and he knows that's a lie. Story 25. It's understood at a surface level that there are no privileged frames of reference in space-time, but sometimes the consequences of this are really counterintuitive. Let's say an astronomer sees a supernova in Galaxy A and another in Galaxy B. He wonders if these supernovas happened at the same time. There is literally no definitive answer to this. It's not just difficult to know whether they happened at the same time, but it's an unanswerable question without appending to an observer at such and such a location to the question, obviously due to the slow asterisk speed of light. An observation right beside supernova A wouldn't see supernova B for ages and ages. But one might well ask, okay, the A location won't see B for a long time, but did they really actually happen at the same time? The question is invalid. There is no such thing as an objective reference time, and thus no such thing as an objective simultaneity. Asterisk, while the speed of light is very fast indeed, the scale of the universe is so vast that it makes light speed comparatively plodding. 